Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul in our continuing survey of ancient history as a framework for the Bible. One of the leading cities on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea was the city of Antioch. Uh, there had been several cities by this name, all named after Antiochus, one of the rulers of the Seleucid Empire, that empire of the Greeks following the age of Alexander. There were at Antioch, in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers. And then we have the names of some of those. Barnabas and Simeon, who is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manayan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Notice some high-powered names. And there was also Saul. Now, Saul was actually from Tarsus, a na neighboring city, um, just about 10 miles inland from the Mediterranean. Sometimes they would build their cities inland so that uh, they would not so readily be accosted by pirates. Um, but Saul had been brought now to this Syrian Antioch, the, the great city of Antioch. We're going to see the not-so-great city a bit later. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. These two men were going to be set apart and sent out as ambassadors of the Lord. Accordingly, they make their preparations, and they travel first to the coastal town of Seleucia, and then across the Mediterranean to the island of, of Cyprus, landing at Salamis, and from there working their way across the island till they come to the capital city, the capital city of, of Cyprus, that is, of Paphos. Now, it's here at Paphos that they're going to encounter the, the proconsul, that is the major governor of the area uh, representing Rome in that part of the world. Here's uh, Paphos. Uh, both of these are, are major cities. But they come across Cyprus and it's their practice, it's going to be their continuing practice each time to preach in the synagogue. Now, why would they go to the synagogue? Because that's where the believers were. That's where the people who believed in God were. The other, the other people were pagans, and they're, they're not even really ready to hear the gospel, or so think Paul, uh, Saul and Barnabas. They have as their helper, and this is going to play into the story a bit later, uh, a young man by the name of John Mark. We'll just refer to him as John here. And they come before, when they finally reach Paphos, they come before the proconsul. We know his name. We know it both from the passage of the Bible, but also from secular literature. His name is Sergius Paulus. Now notice, Paulus, or we say Paul, that's a last name. That's not a first name. Uh, and Sergius Paulus, his last name was Paulus, and Saul, after this point, begins to go by his, his Roman name, his Roman last name, can I say it? Paul. You know, maybe he comes into the court in this hearing before Sergius Paulus and says, oh, I'm a Paulus too. Uh, I'm, that's my last name as well. Was there any relation? Well, probably not. You know, one's Roman, one's Jewish. We don't know how, how Saul had come to have the Roman name Paul. He didn't adopt it on the spot. It was already his. And the passage in, in Acts chapter 13 tells us that as, as Luke, the writer of that account, switches over and begins calling him now Paul instead of Saul. Well, in that instance, there's a, a pagan magician who was there in court and sort of withstood Saul and Barnabas, or now I'm going to call him Paul and Barnabas, uh, and and they put a curse upon him, and he is suddenly blinded. Um, not just spiritually, but physically, he, he, wa he goes out stumbling around because he can't see any longer. And meanwhile, we're told that Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, the person who is for, for in that part of the world, representing the Senate and the people of Rome, he becomes a believer. It's interesting that we have an inscription containing the name Sergius Paulus that's been found in, not in the Antioch we were talking about before in Syria, but in a different Antioch, in Pisidian Antioch, and we're going to see 
Paul and Barnabas go to that city. Now, do they go there because they've been sent there by Sergius Paulus? Maybe he believes and he says, hey, you can go stay with my family if you're going. And I'm not sure if that's the case. We're not told um, anything about what influenced their decision. But we, le we see them leaving Paphos, and from there they move to Perga, and then they get to Perga, and they move inland. Now that's, you know, they in on Cyprus they've been in a widely public arena, but now they go, well, it's a bit like going to the hinterland. In fact, that's exactly what's happening. And they make their way to the Pisidian Antioch, and that's far off the beaten trail. So here we come to the highland uh, plateau of Anatolia. Uh, the Temple of Augustus, uh, the you know the city of Antioch. It's a city, yes, but it's out in the middle of nowhere. And if that weren't already off the beaten track, Paul goes from there. He, he moves from the, the city in Antioch to um, to I Iconium, uh, and then he's going to take a side tr side road of a side road. He goes from there down through the twin villages of Lystra and Derby. As he comes to Lystra, the story develops where he and Barnabas heal a lame man. And the people of the village begin to call them, instead of Paul and Barnabas, they begin to refer to them as Zeus and Hermes. Um, uh, some translations might say say Zeus and, and Mer or Jupiter and Merc Mercury. Uh, these are two gods, but uh, what we have in the Greek text is the Greek versions of their names, Zeus and Hermes. Now, why were they naming uh, Paul and Barnabas by the names of these two pagan Greek gods? Well, to understand that, we have to, to know a bit about the culture, and we get some insight from a book written by Ovid, Ovid was a Roman writer who went around the Mediterranean collecting stories of people who changed from one thing into another, you know, different urban legends and tales and, and mythologies. And one story that he tells is a Phrygian legend of how Zeus and Hermes once came to a village in Phrygia. That's just another uh, name for that whole area there. And uh, everybody was, you know, sort of very standoffish, but they came to the uh, the home of this old man and old woman who showed them hospitality. You now, didn't recognize them for who they were. They were just two strangers. Uh, but invited Zeus and Hermes to lunch and, and gave a meal to them and showed them hospitality. And at the end of the day, they said, you know, by the way, we're Zeus and Hermes. We're, we're great gods with all sorts of power. Do you have any requests? And the, the man and old man and his wife said, well, we, we you know, we'd like to, to continue to live forever. We would, you know, prefer not to die and and we'd like to have uh, immortality. And so, in the story, Zeus and Hermes perform a miracle. They change the old man and the old woman into, into trees, and they, they are planted there, and they just grow the rest of, you know, for all, for, I guess, forever. Uh, they're, they're there, and it's a, it's a nice little mythology. Well, here are these two strangers that have come to town, and they perform a miracle. And the people think, ah, oh, it's Zeus and Hermes. That's, that's where they're getting that from. And Paul and Barnabas say, no, no, we're, we're not gods. We're just regular people. And they share with them the gospel. Now, in Derby, they, they, they don't pick him up. They meet, because they're going to come back that way. They meet Timothy. Then they retrace their steps back to Lystra, Iconium, city in Antioch, Persia. And now they, from Perga, they take a ship all the way back to Seleucia. Uh, they return to Syrian Antioch. And that concludes the first missionary journey. Now, what happens is, th back in Antioch, they go down to Jerusalem, and there's a whole Jerusalem council, and we're not going to go into the de details there. But they come back after that, and after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brethren in every city, which we proclaimed uh, the word of the Lord, and see how they are. And so they're going to go out on a second missionary journey. But at this point, there's an issue, and the issue is who to take with them. And there, you know, there occurred such a sharp division between the two, a sharp disagreement, 
uh, because Barnabas wants to take John, the one who, John Mark, um, and Paul doesn't want to take him because he had bailed out the last time. He had gone part way, and then when the going got tough, he had, he had dropped out. And Paul says, let's not take him. And they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to, to Cyprus. And Paul takes a different traveling companion. Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So they go in two different directions. Now I've got two missionary enterprises. And he takes the land route. He goes, notice, near Tarsus. That's the, the gates of Tarsus there. And he also came to Derby and to Lystra, the same place where they had been before. And there was a disciple there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Maybe Paul had met them. Maybe Paul had even sort of noticed this, this young fellow. But now he's going to take him as a disciple, and Timothy is going to be a follower of Paul, uh, a co-partner in ministry. And so here from, from Lystra and Derby, they're going to continue westward. They pass through then the, uh, the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Here they're, they're moving along, and yet somehow the, the Holy Spirit is making it known to them, don't preach here. And so they're continuing on to where they think they're going to be preaching. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia. That's where they thought they were going to go. Maybe make a big circuit. And the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Again, They don't, and passing by Messiah, they came down to Troas. So instead now, they come to Troas. And here they are. Troas is, is near the ancient site of where Troy was. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, notice on our map we have Macedonia in the north, Greece in the south. Today we think of the two places. There's a kingdom of Macedonia further north. Uh, but that portion, portion of territory that right now is labeled Macedonia, today that's part of Greece. But it wasn't back then. It was considered two separate areas. And so they're moving into Macedonia. What they're doing is they're moving into Europe. And so, putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to, there's an island there called Samothrace. And on the following day, to Neapolis. Now, Neapolis means new city. Um, you go there today, it's got... You go there today, it's got a different name. But I'm, I'm going to refer to it as Neapolis. It's a harbor city. Um, you can still see the Roman aqueducts and some of the construction back from that day. But you go 10 miles inland from Neapolis, and you get to Philippi. And so from there they came to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. Even though it's in Greece, it was a colony of Rome. And we were staying there in this city for some days. You come to this city of Philippi, it's, it's built around a, there's a plateau where the, uh, it's not like a, an Acropolis sort of thing, but it, you know, there was no religious purposes to it. But the governor had his uh, house up on top of the hill, uh, and the city was, you know, around it uh, near to a river. In fact, you, uh, you had a, a Greek theater and a Greek court and, and the Greek bima. But near the outskirts of the city, on just outside the city walls, where you had the governor's palace, there was a Roman graveyard, and near that graveyard flowed the river that brought water to the city. You always want water you know, nearby a city so that people can have something to drink. Here's the graveyard. And then right next to the graveyard is the uh, Crinides River. 
and not a not a major river just a sort of a stream but it's enough to bring water to the area and the women of the city would come out here to wash their clothes as well as to collect water hopefully they collected water upstream and washed their clothes downstream um, and it had been their practice now to have a bible study there by the by the river and so paul comes here and comes to this woman's bible study and begins sharing with them the scriptures and developing some converts and some people believe including a businesswoman by the name of lydia well they believe and while they're while this new little fledgling group of believers are coming together um, paul casts out a demon from a girl who has been she's being used by her owner she's a slave girl and she's been used to tell fortunes and to do some sort of hocus pocus sort of thing and suddenly she's not able to do that anymore because the demon's been cast out and so they bring charges against him and he and silas are cast into prison um if you go to philippi today they'll they'll take you to this sort of uh enclosed cave uh it, there's construction there but it's dug out of the uh, out of the ground uh, and they'll say well that's where the prison was and maybe it, it was all right i don't know i wasn't there um but while they are in prison um first of all they've been beaten and they've been chained there in prison and they're singing praises to the lord and and suddenly there's an earthquake and the the uh, captain of the prison the fellow in charge comes running down thinking they've escaped and he's ready to to run himself through lest it be uh, a great sh dishonor and shame to him that he's allowed prisoners to escape and they say no no we're, we're we're here and he comes to them and they lead him to jesus uh, and he takes them home and there is an uh, entire family believes and, and they're baptized but the next day, he brings them back into the prison because and, and, they don't want to get him into trouble. He's a new convert now. And uh, he's, Paul sends words uh, to, the Rome, to the authorities of the city. It's a free city. I started to say the Romans. They're, they're not Romans. They're, they're uh, colonists. And he sends uh, word to them saying, by the way, do you know that when you beat us the other day, uh, you were beating a Roman citizen? Now, that, that you weren't allowed to do that. That was a major crime. And it could bring the full weight of Rome against the the city, and so they say, "Oh, we we didn't mean to do that. Here, can we let you out of out of your prison?" And Paul says, "Well, uh, maybe I, I will uh, be allowed to be released if you uh, if you come and apologize." And he, he really presses the issue a bit. And what happens is that the officials give him a very looks like a very public apology, and he doesn't leave Philippi. He stays there a few more days. And the reason he's doing that is so that it will have the idea to the authorities in Philippi, Philippi hands off these new Christians. Because you could get into trouble if you mess with them. And we know the rest of the story, because Paul's later on is going to write a, an epistle to the Philippians, and there'll still be a church there. In fact, you go there today and you can see the ruins of a third or fourth century church that is still standing in Philippi so so the church at Philippi was there and remained for a long period now from Philippi Paul is going to move now to the west to Thessalonica although if you go to Greece today they'll call it Thessaloniki so sometimes I slip and call it by its modern pronunciation Thessalonica, or as they say, Thessaloniki is right on the coast, and it's the number two city, maybe number three in that day, but today it's the, the second largest city in all of Greece. Uh, major city, uh, right on the Gulf. In fact, on a clear day, and I happened to be there on a day right after it had rained, and uh, washed all the smog away, on a clear day you can see Mount Olympus across the bay. And it's uh, just interesting to see, here's a city that was under the shadow of the Greek gods. You know, Mount Olympus was where all the Greek gods were supposed to be. And yet there was, there was a synagogue here as well. And Paul comes into the uh, synagogue. Now, there's a picture of the Agora, but there was a synagogue in that area. Um, here's another picture of, of that same Agora. By the way, these ruins are located right smack in the middle of modern-day Thessaloniki. They were getting ready to build a big uh, department store, uh, and they were digging out the foundations, and they found, found these ruins. And they said, oh, we've got to hold up, and, and they made it into an archaeological park. 
Well, um, Paul establishes a church at Thessalonica. And from here, when, when actually uh, what happens is the Jews in the synagogue sort of rise up against Paul and bring charges up against him, and things are starting to get a little hot. And so he and Silas leave Thessalonica, and they go to a much smaller village, uh, an inland village, known as Berea. And Berea, like I said, it's, it's off the beaten track. So, you know, you've had Paul coming to some major cities like Thessalonica and even Philippi, and then some minor little towns like Berea. And in Berea, he comes in the synagogue, just like they always do, and they share the good news with him. And in Berea, the people in the synagogue, the Jewish people, say, wow, that's great, we'd love to hear more about that. And many of them believe. But after a while, those who were in Thessalonica... Uh, th those Jews that are there come to Berea and stir up problems against them there. And so Paul again has to leave. And this time he goes by boat all the way down to a place near Athens. And then you have to go overland because Athens is inland. But he comes finally to the city of Athens. Now the city of Athens gets its name from Athena. That's the goddess to whom the temple on top of the Acropolis is dedicated. Uh, here's a, a artist reconstruction of what it would have looked like in that day. And, and most of what you're seeing still remains even today. Here's a model of that same area. Uh, Athens was greatly cultured, even though it was not the capital of the area. That had long since departed, and, and nowadays the capital of Achaia, or what we call Greece, was down in Corinth. Uh, and yet... Uh, the, the city occupied a special place in the hearts of people uh, because it was a place of culture, of, uh, of thought, of philosophy. Um, the Parthenon itself was actually uh, destroyed. Notice how they're doing some rebuilding. It was destroyed in 1687 when uh, the, the Turks were using it as a supply depot and storing gunpowder uh, that uh, got hit by some artillery and blew up the whole center part of the, of the temple. There were two uh, philosophies that were present in Athens at this time. First of all, the Epicureans. Epicurus uh, had founded a school in Athens 300 years before Paul. Uh, and his philosophy is, is described by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15.32. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we may die. In other words, uh, this is all you get. There's no future judgment, no life after death. Um, you, when you're dead, you're dead. Um, and... Um, and God's not really even concerned with what you're doing in the present, let alone in the future. No afterlife. Um, so you might as well enjoy what you have now. Over against that, there was a philosophy uh, that had been originated by Zeno, uh, also 300 plus years uh, before, before Paul. Uh, and this was the philosophy of the Stoics. And they taught that everything that you see, um, everything that, that's all there is. Uh, that it's only that which is corporeal, that which you can taste or touch. Uh, and so if you want to learn about reality, you have to discipline your mind um, and just be very careful and, and then just think through what you're doing. So both of these philosophies were, were physical in their outlook. Neither one of them looked to an afterlife, but they had come to two different sorts of conclusions. The Epicureans said, um, let's, let's enjoy it. They emphasized pleasure. Now, it wasn't a, a pleasure like do crazy things, but, but enjoy what you have. And the Stoics said, um, think through what you have. Uh, you know, live it in all virtue and simplicity. It was these two philosophies that you would often have discussed. There was a place uh, just outside the Parthenon called the Areopagus. The word Ares uh, means, uh, that's the, the Greek rendition of the Roman god Mars, the god of war. And Apagus is a hill, so Mars Hill or the Areopagus. Uh, and, and just under the, the Parthenon, uh, there you have the Acropolis in the distance and the Areopagus in the foreground. It was here that it was here that the philosophers would gather to argue their philosophies, and when they when they meet the Apostle Paul, they say, well, we'd like to bring you uh, here to our Areopagus, where we can hear your new, your new philosophy. To understand Paul's sermon, we have to know just a bit about Greek history. 600 years before uh, Paul comes on the scene, 
Athens had gone through a very deathly famine um, where there was just all sorts of problems. They thought, well, gee, maybe uh, we've offended one of the gods and a Greek pagan philosopher slash prophet by the name of Epimenides came up with a solution. He said, let's take a flock of sheep and turn them loose on the Areopagus and uh, we'll just let them sort of roam all around. And whenever one of them stops to lie down and won't eat, then we'll erect an altar there and we'll sacrifice that, that sheep to whatever god is of that area. We don't know who it is, so it's going to be a, we're going to erect an altar to an unknown god. And there were a number of these altars that were still standing all around Athens. And so Paul, uh, in, as he's in the Areopagus, and they're asking him, uh, what is this stuff that you believe? He says, uh, I've noticed these altars to an unknown god. Let me tell you about him. He's the god uh, that you, of, of whom you don't know. And he's the God who made heaven and earth, and he doesn't reside in any sort of temple, um, and he doesn't even really need altars. But uh, he has called you to repent because he has fixed a day of judgment and a way for you to face it by raising uh, someone from the dead. And um, they hear this message, and there are some who believe, and of course many others who do not. Now, after Athens, Paul's going to move down to Corinth. Um, and Corinth is, let's look at the map. Corinth is right on the isthmus of the Corinth. It's the, that place uh, that joins together northern and southern Greece. You can go there today, and nowadays there's a channel that has been cut through that allows ships to, uh, to communicate, to pass from one side of Greece to the other without making that big, long detour. Actually, Nero, in his day, attempted the same feat to dig this canal. It wasn't until the um, late 1800s that the canal was completed. And here we come to Corinth. It's located just south of that isthmus uh, at the base of the Acrocorinth. Notice that big Acropolis in the background. Uh, up there was the uh, temple to Aphrodite. You know, Athens had Athena. They had Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And that sort of uh, cast a pallor of what you did in Corinth. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the altar that you, or not altar, the temple that you see here is the ruins of the Temple of Apollos. Uh, that temple, as we can see, was within, uh, you, could, you could stand there and you could see the isthmus. You could see the both sides of the Aegean on each side of that. And to act like a Corinthian had become the byword. Uh, when you said somebody acted like a Corinthian, you were saying that they acted in an immoral manner. There's the Acropolis, uh, a close-up of that. And right on the back steps of the Temple of Apollo, you walk in uh, one way into the temple, and, and I've taken this picture standing in the marketplace. On the, on the back door of the temple was the city marketplace. So when an, a sacrifice would be brought to be offered to the idol, they'd give to that pagan god the part that he wanted. <laughs> the priest would take his part. And then the rest of it would, would be sold in the marketplace. So that you have this idea of food being offered to idols. And if you're going out to buy a hamburger, you don't know what its pedigree was. We also have the Bema seat. Now, every Greek city had a Bema seat. That is, um, a podium, a stand, where the judge stood or, or sat. In fact, if you go to Greece today, uh, and you go into the place where their parliament meets, and the raised platform, they still refer to that even today as the Bema. Here we are in the main street, um, uh, where, the, you know, where things were sold. And Christianity takes root here in Corinth, so that a church is planted, and Paul remains here for the better part of two years. When we think of sporting events today, we often think of the Olympics, but back then, uh, much more popular were the Isthmus Games that were held at Corinth, and Paul uses this when he is um, writing to the Corinthians. He talks about how everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a, a, a perishable wreath. But we're involved in something much greater. We're involved in receiving an imperishable wreath. 
Well, Paul is going to leave Corinth then, and he's making his way back to Jerusalem. But on the way, leaving the harbor and going across to, uh, the Aegean, he finds himself for the first time in Ephesus. Now, the city of Ephesus, um, and, and actually one of the inscriptions that we found uh, reads Mount Ephesus, and I think one of the reasons they might have called it that, is because the, uh, the city in Paul's day was actually built betu between two hills. Now, we're looking at the terrain the way it looks today, although the shoreline has uh, receded greatly over the last 2,000 years. In Paul's day, it was much closer. Uh, let's look at a photo. Notice the difference between the modern shoreline way in the distance and the ancient shoreline which came right up to the city. It meant that Ephesus was not only a port city, but it was the major port for the entire area. That this was a, a wealthy city, a city, a city that enjoyed all sorts of commerce and the benefits of, of all that the world had to offer. It's interesting that when Paul writes his epistle to the church at Ephesus, he speaks to them in the first three chapters of the, of the great wealth that they had, not the material wealth, but the spiritual wealth where God had lavished upon them all wisdom and insight, uh, had blessed them with every spiritual blessing, and likewise he prayed for them that they might be enlightened to know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. This was a city that had it all, and this was a church that Paul tells them, you have it all too, but it's not the same sort of have it all that the world has. Here's the library of Celsus. Now this is going to be built after Paul's day, and yet Celsius is a uh, a Greek teacher who teaches against Christianity. So what we have here is a battle of the cultures, a battle for the hearts and souls of the people of the world. Paul visits Ephesus. His first visit is described in Acts chapter 18. Uh, they came to Ephesus and he left them there. And he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. That's, after all, his regular modus operandi. And when they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent, but taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills. And, and he left Ephesus. He goes to Jerusalem. Um, all sorts of things happen there. All sorts of things happen there. And he comes to Ephesus again. This is his third missionary journey, but his second visit to Ephesus. Came about that while Apollos was at Corinth, and uh, he's been introduced earlier, Paul, having passed through the upper country, came to Ephesus and found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, Well, gee, we're sort of behind the times. We haven't even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And, and uh, he says, Well, you got baptized. Into what were you baptized? And they said, Well, into John's baptism. In other words, they'd heard about John the Baptist and his preaching that a Messiah is coming, but they hadn't heard the rest of the story. And so Paul joins them. He comes into the synagogue. He'd been invited back already. And he's teaching there for about three months. But at the end of that time, resistance to his teaching begins to arise, and he's cast out of the synagogue. That doesn't stop Paul. He turns, uh, he goes across the street to the school of Tyrannus. In fact, uh, and he's going to be there for two years. I sort of imagine him just taking the sign that says Bible studies, the Apostle Paul, and, and just changing the direction in which it points uh, as he teaches now at the school of Tyrannus uh, in at two years. And so it's not that Paul is going to all the surrounding cities, but his gospel is going to all the surrounding cities and he, his message is changing the world. Now, it's a, a couple of years into that ministry where resistance comes not from the Jews, but from the pagan idol worshippers. There's a certain man named Demetrius who was a silversmith and his job was making shrines of Artemis. This was one of the gods and the patron goddess of, of uh, the city of Ephesus was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. You can go outside the city of Ephesus and there are ruins there. Actually, not much ruins. There's basically one column and one 
well, you can see it's mostly just a swampy area, where once stood the temple of Artemis. And uh, Demetrius gathers a crowd together in the theater. And he says, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a problem here in, uh, here in Ephesus. And not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute because people are getting rid of all their idols, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship should even be dethroned from her magnificence. This temple in Paul's day was considered to be one of the wonders of the world, tw four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens. You go there today and there's, there's nothing left. And so th a crowd gathers in the theater of Ephesus. And you can just imagine, you know, thousands of them, I'm not sure how many this theater seats, but they are chanting for a, a good solid two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, paying tribute to their goddess. And Paul says, you mean all those pagans are gathered there? Here, let me come and, and speak to them. He's, he's ready to go share the gospel to them. And his friends and others in the church say, no, you can't do that. They'll tear you apart. And, and so they send him on his way, which is probably for the best. Paul leaves Ephesus and he goes on his way. But we are left with a reminder in his epistle, in his epistle to this book, uh, to the people of, of this book, not only of the riches that they have, but of the walk to which they are called. You see, that's the big idea in, in Ephesians. The first three chapters are about the riches that we have in Christ Jesus. But he gets to chapter 4 and he says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Again, in chapter 4, verse 17, he says, So I say this and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in futility of their mind, not like the way you used to walk, but instead, chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma.